Well, welcome everyone. Today I'm trying to explain to you what is a healthcare directive, what is an advanced care plan, and why you should have one. I'll provide all the links that you'll see in this uh, slideshow uh, in the evaluation I'll be sending out after the presentation. I love, I love it. Today, I'm going to start covering the following six points. I'll explain the purpose of a healthcare directive. I'll explain the purpose of advanced care planning. I'll try to demystify legal issues around advanced care planning and healthcare directives, as well as the difference between advanced care plan and a power of attorney. We're gonna look into common misconceptions. We'll help make uh, informed choices and we'll provide you with the tools to complete your own planning kit. So now let's just start off by looking at some definitions. Our first definition is a healthcare directive. Okay, a healthcare directive is a written document or set of documents that is used to express your healthcare wishes when you are no longer able to personally communicate those wishes. This does not require a lawyer. Our next definition is advanced care planning. And this is a mouthful. Advanced care planning is a process of reflection and communication, a time for you to reflect on your values and wishes and to let others know your future health and personal care preferences in the event that you become incapable of consenting to or refusing treatment or other care. Advanced care planning means having discussions with family and friends, especially your substitute decision maker or the person who will speak for you when you cannot. It also includes writing down your wishes and may even involve talking with healthcare providers and financial and legal profession, professionals. Our next definition is power of attorney. A power of attorney is a legal document in which one person called the donor gives the authority to another person called the attorney to manage some or all of the donor, donor's financial affairs. That means bank, investments, property, et cetera. What is a po enduring power of attorney? The law provides that the authority under a power of attorney ends if the donor becomes mentally incompetent and incapable of managing his or her own financial affairs. However, the law also provides a donor to include a clause in the power of attorney document allowing the attorney to continue acting even if the donor becomes mentally incompetent. If this clause called the enduring clause is included in the power of attorney, the document is referred to as an enduring power of attorney. In either case, the power of attorney becomes invalid when the donor dies. A power of attorney cannot be used to bequeath property upon the death of a donor. Powers of attorney deal only with financial matters and not with personal decisions. A legal guide, a legal information guide for seniors is probably the best resource that's out there for you. Unfortunately, it's only available online. Uh, it used to be printed and I used to hand them out, but that has changed. If you would like more information on your legal rights, we're holding another Zoom session on uh, Knowing Your Rights Seniors on Tuesday, November 30th at 10 a.m. Okay. All right, let's talk about a healthcare directive versus advanced care planning. All right. Advanced care planning is not the same as a healthcare directive. Healthcare directives often include explicit instructions to consent or withhold consent to treatment in specific circumstances. This may also serve to formally assign a substitute decision maker in the event 
the, the patient becomes incapacitated. Advanced care planning involves learning about the types of decisions that might need to be made, considering those decisions ahead of time, and then letting others know, both your family and your healthcare providers, about your preferences. These preferences are often put into an advanced care directive, the legal document that goes into effect only if you're incapacitated and unable to speak for yourself. This could be the result of a disease or a severe injury, and no matter how old you are. It helps others to know what kind of medical treatment you want. A healthcare directive also allows you to express your values and desires related to end of life care. You might think of this as a living document, sometimes called a living will, a document that you can adjust as your situation changes because of new information or a change in your health care. All right. So let's take a look at the Manitoba Healthcare Directive. This is the form. It's very simple. It has three sections. Um, it allows you to designate a proxy or two. It has a very limited space for your treatment instructions. And then it's being signed. On a brief aside, the healthcare directive form is also part of the Emergency Response Information Kit, otherwise known as ERIC. All right, and this is a, the front of the ERIC kit. The Emergency Response Information Kit is also an important part of your healthcare directive. The red dot on your door will inform first responders that you have a healthcare directive and it's located on the fridge. This will be their first priority when dealing with an unconscious or incapacitated patient. So it's important to have an ERIC kit, all right? So let's look at the healthcare directive, all right? Well, I have several questions I hope I can answer for you. What is the purpose of a healthcare directive? As a Manitoba citizen, you have the right to accept or refuse medical treatment at any time. The Healthcare Directives Act allows you to express your wishes about the amount and type of health care and treatment you want to receive should you become unable to speak or otherwise communicate yourself. It also allows you to give another person the power to make a decision for you should you be unable to make a decision for yourself. Why should I fill out the form? Well, due to an accident or illness, you may become unable to say what treatment you'd like and under what, what conditions. If you have a signed directive, those close to you and the healthcare professionals treating you are relieved of the burden of guessing what your wishes might be. How do I make a healthcare directive? Well, as we've seen, the Manitoba government has prepared a form for your convenience. The form serves as a guide for providing the appropriate information. However, any paper that's signed and dated and provides the same information may be used. A directive may be made by anyone capable of making healthcare decisions and understanding the consequences of those decisions. Who do I talk to about the decisions? Well, it's strongly recommended you talk to your doctor before completing the directive. This will ensure that your instructions are clear and easily understood by those who provide treatment. Your choices should then be clearly typed out or printed. What is a proxy? I've referred to that several times. The choices you make in a directive are very personal. The person or persons you choose to represent you should be close friends or relatives who are willing to accept this responsibility. You should discuss your wishes openly and in detail with them. It's wise to name more than one proxy in case one is not available when needed. If you designate two proxies, you must decide how you want them to work, either independently or together as a team. If you decide the two proxies should work jointly, they will have to act together on your behalf. 
if you decide they should work consecutively, the second proxy will be contacted if the first is not available or is unwilling to make the required decisions at the required time. It's important to make sure that your proxy or proxies understand what is expected and is, and is willing to speak for you and act for you. Who do I choose as my proxy? Oh, I did that. I'm sorry, I missed that one. <laughs> Can I change my mind about a healthcare directive? Yes, a healthcare directive should be a record of your current wishes. If at any time you wish to change the content or the proxies you have listed, all copies of your old directive should be destroyed and a new directive written. What is the effect of a healthcare directive? The wishes you express in your directive are binding on your friends, relatives, and healthcare professionals unless they're not consistent with accepted healthcare practices. And they'll be honored by the courts. However, healthcare professionals treating you are not obliged to search for or ask about a directive. It's important to be sure that your family, your friends, your doctor, and your proxy know you have a directive and know where it can be found. That's probably the most important thing that we can stress. So let's look at a little myths versus fact. All right. So the first myth is you must have a healthcare directive to stop treatment near the end of life. Well, treatment can be stopped without a healthcare directive if everyone involved agrees. However, without some kind of advanced care directive, decisions may be more difficult and disputes more likely. The healthcare directive is more useful and versatile, but because it applies to all healthcare decisions and empowers the person you name to make the decisions for you in the way you want them made. Over two thirds of the adult population have no healthcare directive. You have to use your provincial statutory form for your healthcare directive to be valid. No, though most provinces have a particular form as we've seen, all you require is witnessing or other specific signing formalities. Even if your province requires a specific form, doctors will still have a legal obligation to respect your treatment wishes, regardless of the form you use. Most official forms are either worded too generally or include multiple options that may be too broad to guide decisions about the particular medical situation you may find yourself in near the end of your life. And we'll discuss this a little later. The critical task is to clarify your values, beliefs, and particular wishes that you want others to follow if they may make decisions for you. Next myth, healthcare directives are legally binding, so doctors have to follow them. Well, healthcare directive laws merely give doctors and others immunity if they follow your valid directive. Doctors can always refuse to comply with your wishes if they have an objection of conscience or consider your wishes medically inappropriate. However, they may have an obligation to transfer you to another healthcare provider who will comply. And I think a good example of that is if you have a um, medically assisted uh, death wish and you're at St. Boniface Hospital, they will not follow those wishes and they will transfer you to a hospital that will allow those wishes to be followed. Okay. Healthcare directives mean do not treat. No. A healthcare directive can express both what you want and what you don't want. Never assume it simply means do not treat. Even if you do not want treatment to cure you, you should always be kept reasonably pain-free and comfortable. Too often healthcare directives are triggers for disengagement by the medical staff. Directives do not say, don't treat me. They say, treat me the way I want to be treated. 
If I name a healthcare proxy, I give up the right to make my own decisions. No. Naming a healthcare proxy or agent does not give away that right of your authority. You always have the right while you're still competent to override the decisions of your proxy or revoke the directive. If you don't name a proxy or agent, the likelihood of needing a court appointed guardian grows greater, especially if there's disagreement regarding your treatment among family and doctors. The next myth, should I wait until I'm sure about what I want before I sign a healthcare directive? No. Most of us have some ambivalence about what we should want, and that's okay, because treatment near end of life can be complicated. We can't predict all the facts and circumstances that may face us in the future, and treatment wishes may change. You can at least appoint a proxy if you have someone you trust. Many studies have shown that patients want their doctors to discuss advanced care planning with them before they become ill. Many others have shown a positive response from patients when advanced care directive discussions are held during outpatient visits. Just talking to my doctor and family about what I want is not legally effective. Well, meaningful discussions with your doctor and family is actually the most important step. The question of what is legally effective is misleading because even a legally effective document does not automatically carry out your wishes. The best strategy is to use a good healthcare decision workbook to help you clarify your wishes, to talk to your physician, your healthcare agent, and your family about your wishes. And again, put them in writing in advance care directive and make sure everybody has a copy. Once I give my doctor a signed copy of my directive, my task is done. No, you've just started. First, make sure your doctor understands and supports your wishes. Second, there's no guarantee that your directive will follow you in a medical record, especially if you're transferred from one facility to another. You or your proxy should always double check to be sure your providers are aware of your directives and have a copy. Advanced planning is an ongoing process. Review your wishes yearly or anytime your health or family status changes. Make appropriate changes and communicate those changes as needed. If I'm living at home and don't want to be resuscitated by an EMS team, if my heart or breathing stops, my healthcare directive must say so. Well, your healthcare directive may usually not help you in this situation. If someone calls 911, EMS must attempt to resuscitate you and transport you to a hospital, unless you have an emergency response information kit with your healthcare directive on your fridge. <coughs> and the healthcare directives are only for old people. No. Though it's true that more older rather than younger people use healthcare directives, every adult should have one. Younger adults actually have more at stake because if stricken by a serious disease or accident, medical technology may keep them alive, but, in, but in sedated for decades. Some of the most well-known right to die cases arose from the experience of young people incapacitated by a tragic illness or car accidents and were maintained on life support. So let's investigate what an advanced care can be. And I'm sorry this is a bit worried, but it's really important you understand this. None of us know what tomorrow will bring or can predict what might become of our health but there's a way to ensure that you have a say in your healthcare decisions that lie ahead. Should there come a time when you're unable to speak for yourself? This is called advanced care planning. And advanced care planning is a way to help you think about, talk about, 
and share your thoughts and wishes about future health care. It gives you a voice in decision making, helps you determine who would communicate for you if you're unable to communicate for yourself, and should include conversations with your health care team. Everyone should have a say in their health care. Plan ahead today to ensure that your wishes are known, no matter what the future holds for your family and your health. Advanced Care Planning Workbook. A guide to an advanced care planning with thought-provoking questions to answer and important details about various healthcare treatments, as well as tips on developing and sharing your advanced care plan. So this is what we're going to look at next, are the workbooks. There are two very good tools available to you. The first is the WRHA's Advanced Care Planning, and the second is Dying with Dignity's Who Will Speak for You. So we'll look at the WRHA's first. So this is their Advanced Care Planning Workbook. It's a six-page document, and unfortunately, it's only available online. Again, the link will be provided in the evaluation afterwards. So this is a page from their planning book. Here it shows you the questions that you really have to think about and answer. Questions like, is it a physical health or a mental health issue? What is important to you? What gives meaning to life? What are your values? your beliefs that guide you? Are you an organ donor? What worries or concerns <clears throat> about end of life are you concerned about? And what are your final requests? So again, these are broad questions uh, asking you to give thought to how you wanna be treated. There are things that you must consider when you're developing your guide. The document discusses the various treatments that are available and explains some of the basic definitions. It shows you why you must discuss this with your loved ones. When once know what your goals of care are, how you make your wishes known and how to prepare for this decision. So it's, it's a background information on how to approach your planning and to help you make decisions and start the discussion. The next one I'll look at, which is a much more detailed process, is the Advanced Care Planning Kit, Who Will Speak For You? And this is put out by uh, Dying With Dignity. It's over 30 pages long. It has a lot of discussion about situations, uh, definitions, and uh, it has, this particular package you'll see is the Manitoba edition. So this reflects all of the Manitoba laws that are currently in effect. This was last reviewed in 2019 and it provides a lot of detailed information. So before I go into that, I'll ask, are there any questions at this point? Because I'm going on and I really wanna make sure that everybody has a chance to jump in there. Okay, I haven't heard anything and I can't see, so I'll continue on and we'll have questions afterwards. So thank you for your patience. So with this guide, we're gonna look at the types of questions that you're required to consider when developing your plan. Again, they include asking about your proxy and they ask that your proxy actually complete one as well. And then you discuss the results. It's a very interesting approach. It's not one-sided there. It's meant to have discussions. And you'll see that these questions are much more specific and that you have multiple options for your consideration. You know, the yes, a no, trial basis. I request medical assistance in dying. It provides you with much more detail. Some of the specific situations can be discussed, you know, whether you can feed yourself or not, and how you want to be fed. Do you have advanced diseases? 
What about long standing issues that you have with disease? And then if you're weak, but your mind is sharp, how do you deal with that? So again, it's making you think of not just, I don't want to be resuscitated or I do. It, it, it is allowing you to make decisions about how you want to be treated in various situations. It's a lot to be considered for you. They want to know what are your values. They want to know what are your, your wishes are. If you have this, what do you want to happen? Um, if you're terminally ill, what are the possible options that you want? If you're put into a coma and your body's <clears throat> kept alive, these, these are very, very hard decisions. But again, if you have discussed this and you've written it down and there's somebody who knows about it, this will make things easier for you, for the, your family and for the caregivers. Uh, again, now that you've thought about what are the possibilities, here you have the, the opportunity to define what steps or treatments you will or won't accept. This document ensures that everything is clearly explained and will state what your wishes are for the various possible scenarios. As I said, this will empower you to control your medical treatments. And finally, with this, you've reviewed all the available information. You've thought about what your wishes are. You've chosen a proxy. You've completed and signed the documents. What's next? Well, all this work you've done is of no value if nobody knows about it. So I can't stress again, that you need to speak to your families and your friends about the decisions and wishes you make. You need to make copies of your healthcare directive. You need to give it to your doctor. You need to give it to your family. You should carry one with you. My mother is 101 years old and she has her Eric kit. She's reduced it and put it in her purse and it goes with her wherever she goes. She's forward thinking and planning. As an, and as always, Make sure it's in your Eric kit. And you all know by now what an Eric kit is. So here's your list of what you need to do. First, download the WRHA Advanced Care Planning Kit. Download the Dying with Dignity Advanced Care Planning Kit. Download the legal guide for seniors. And I'm sorry that I have to say download, but these guides are just not printed. Okay. Once you have the information, review it. Review it in detail. Talk to your family and talk to your friends about it. These are the people who, who love you and want to know and respect you and, and make sure that your wishes are followed. Make sure you complete the forms. Make sure you copy and you circulate the forms. And finally, make sure you have an emergency response information kit. And where can you get an emergency information response kit? You can get it from me. And with that, I know it's a lot, but that's why I want to sit down now and talk to you about your questions. How is it that we, we can ensure that you've got all the tools you need and you're available, we're available to help you as much as we can. And pardon me while I just move my screen around. So with that, Questions. Oh boy. Come on. Mark, I have a question. Okay. It's, it's Karen. What is the difference between dying with dignity and MAID? M A I D. Okay. Well, medical assi assisted, 
medical assisted something in dying is a process where you work with your doctors and you apply for this process to be <coughs> instigated in your health situations. It, right now, you can have medically assisted uh, death with terminal diseases, with um, they're working with some mental diseases, but it has to be through a doctor. It has to be a process. Dignity in Dying is an organization that is to out there to help people through the process of end of life care. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Um, okay. How, if you have done one years ago, how often do they need to be updated or do they, uh, your directives, do they well, just last forever? Well, the directive is, is, will be as current as you make it. If you have filled one out and made no changes, but your health has changed, then your directive is empowered, but incorrect. So you should always update your healthcare directive as your family or your health situation changes. You should always ensure that when you make a change, your proxy and your doctors have an updated copy. So I, uh, dating and signing them is very important. So probably talking to your doctor would allow you to decide whether you need to update? Yes, that would be a very good okay. step. Okay. Next. Henry? Um, I... Go ahead. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, I'm out in, I'll speak. I'm, what do you do if the, uh, uh, okay, you discuss it with your family doctor, but then I was in a situation where my sister was in the hospital, not able to communicate, and there were so many doctors in the, in the emergency room or in the care. Once it was one doctor, then it was the next doctor at different hours of the day. And uh, they really did not take time to, to look at or even ask for a director. Yeah, that's where patient advocacy comes in. And that's where uh, a proxy is best to be named and involved. It's been extremely hard to be a patient advocate during COVID. I know uh, having taken my mother to the hospital, once they get into emergency, you are unable to be with them. You can't speak for them. You know, if somebody who goes in who doesn't speak English, uh, English is a second or third language, they go into a hospital, if their proxy or their advocate isn't with them, communication is so difficult and decisions are made that may go against someone's belief system unintentionally and with the best of intentions. But again, that's why having a directive with you is the best thing to do. I know when I, when I take my mother to the hospital, I always make sure that she has her forms with her in her purse. I pack up as much things as I can for her to ensure that she can operate independently. A lot of information is out there but it's just finding it. And I, again, that's why I, I put the legal information guide for seniors. It hasn't been updated, but the laws haven't changed that much. Um, and um, I think that it's a, it's a very important read for all seniors. Know your legal rights. Make sure that you're looked after and that you're living the life the way you want to as long as you can. <laughs>